So let's introduce the Monte Carlo techniques. At first, Monte Carlo isn't a single technique. It's a set of techniques that rely largely on the creation of random numbers. That's why it's called as the Monte Carlo Casino. It was first developed by Metropolis and others in order to create the atomic bomb during the Metropolis project. Let's first do a first introduction and then slowly go to what we use in molecular simulations. So what we use to do molecular Monte Carlo. At first, If you would like to estimate the area of the circle, knowing the area of the square, and all what you have is the possibility to draw them on the floor and throw some stones in a completely random way. How could you calculate the area of the circle by knowing only the area of the square? Simple you will have a number of thrown stones, you will have a number of stones that went out and you won't count them, then you will have a number of them who went inside the square, so n square, and a number of them who went inside the circle, n circle. So you could ex uh, give as an estimate of the area of the circle as the number of stones that fell inside the circle divided the number of stones that fell inside the square is equal to the area of the circle divided the area of the square. And so, we know the area of the square, so the area of the circle will simply be the number of stones in the circle, circle divided the number of stones in the square times the area of the square. And here you have an approximate solution for the area of the circle by simply throwing random stones. Of course, right now I was considering that to throw them uniformly, in a complete random way. And that's actually the most simple way of doing a Monte Carlo, random sampling. If you have something you want to measure, you in a completely random way, so with uh, the probability distribution that is constant, will simply sample some points on the system, and then give an approximate solution to the problem you're having. Now in this case it was to know the area of the circle. But it could be, and it's often used, to calculate the value of an integral for example. Let's say if we have a very very strange two-dimensional integral, a very strange three-dimensional function that does random stuff and it's zero elsewhere and you don't really know where it starts, where it doesn't, so something very strange that you don't really know, you could simply start throwing stones here and there, and then you and calculate, like here the integral is zero, here it's zero, here it's some value, here it's zero, here it's another value, and you go on, and so you estimate the value of the integral. This way you will be able to approximate the value of the integral using the theorem of the integral average I think it's called in English where you can say that the integral of you know, a function in whatever is equal to between a and b is equal to b minus a and the average of the function. So here we will create an average and in this way we will be able to estimate the value of the integral. But okay, you can immediately see that there may be some problems. For example, 
I might have a very small circle. In this way, probably I would say that the area of the circle is zero. Or I could have a huge circle, and so the area of the circle could become equal to the area of the square, even though we know that's not possible. So how could we solve these problems? Yeah, okay, I could make the circle smaller, bigger, but that's an easy situation. We very, very often don't know the function, don't know how the function is not made, or we know it more or less, but not precisely, so we'll have to find other ways. Like, for example, we could make a random walk, because maybe we don't know where the domain ends, so we simply do a random walk and start exploring the space. If it tries to go outside, you will refuse to move and count this point again. Or in general, when we use a random walk in Monte Carlo, each time we refuse a move for some reason, you will see that there are plenty of reasons to do it, we will recount the position in which we were before. And then slowly start exploring the whole system. But again, how big are we doing these steps? Are we doing them very small in order to explore the system properly and have many many accepted steps? Because it will be quite difficult for it to go out? No, because we will simply stay in a small place and we might get stuck in the corner. So if we start here we may think that this circle is everything, so get a wrong result, or that this square is everything and get a wrong result. We might use very huge steps, but 99% of them will be refused because they will always try to go out. And so they're not a solution again. So again, what's the right step? Good question. There are many approaches to it, and everyone is good in a certain domain. Then we might have another problem. What if, now I show the function by profile, but we'll always consider for now 2D functions. What if we have something that is very similar to a circus tent? So, very spiked and nothing on the sides. So let's, by seeing it from up, you will see the, something like a circle that is almost zero and then it grows very, very quickly to here. If I do random sampling or a random walk that simply avoids you to go out but nothing more, you will probably never get the pike. Never get up here or not, not even up here. So if you are calculating the, in the volume under it, you will get a completely false result. You will probably get something very, very similar to zero. But we know it's not zero. So how do we get up here? We could go, do a random walk that will accept more often steps that bring it up. In this way, it will be biased to go up. So if we are, for example, here, if it's drawing a move here, it might be accepted, but probably it will probably be rejected. Let's say like with a 30% probability of being accepted. Well, if it goes up, you give it a 70%, for example, probability to be accepted, or maybe even a 100%. In this way, you will see that you will slowly start sampling up here. But as you gave it a possibility to, to go down, it will also sample the rest. Because otherwise, if you give it a too high bias to go up, a too, if you pull it too much to go up, it would stay stuck up here, and you will get the integral of a constant function instead of getting the integral of your piped function. So it would again be a completely useless result as, it, as before when it gave you zero. So you must give it the possibility to go up and down enough to explore the whole space in a short enough time. So in this case you simply do a random walk that only depends on the position in which you are and it will simply go in the direction that you think is more important. And we will go again to this thing later on. Now, 
what is the best way you should throw your points in order to get, for example, the integral of a function or in general in order to understand how a function is done or how something is done. The best way is that the probability of throwing points of throw is more or less equal to the probability of the function. If we can are able to do this, we will sample more where the function is more important, less where the function isn't present, but we will sample a bit of all the space. And we will get the best result possible. Actually, if they are perfectly equal, we will get the best uh, result absolutely possible. But there is a problem. Usually, at least in molecular systems, we have no idea of this probability distribution because this depends on the partition function of the ensemble you're, you're exploring. So, for example, if you're exploring the canonical exam ensemble, we have no idea of the partition function of the canonical ensemble. It's, we usually always try to avoid calculating it because calculating it properly is incredibly complicated. Okay, that's a good information. The problem is that we have no idea how to do it. So, therefore, uh, Metropolis introduced important sampling. That is actually incredible. More or less what I said about the random walk that goes more up and down. Important sampling is a situation in which you do a random walk and you accept all the moves that make you go in a good direction and reject with a certain probability all the moves that bring you outside. Like on um, under understanding molecular simulations, they make an example if you have all Africa, pretend it's Africa, and you want to know how deep the Nile is, one thing could be throwing points of everywhere. A big, a huge amount of these points will simply not be in the Nile, in the river. Or you could start a random walk somewhere. And, but simply, uh, if the random walk, okay, it would be good to start it in the Nile. That's, so, for example, you start it here. If you go in a deeper path, because you want to know how deep the river is, you always accept it, while if you go in a less deep path, you s only sometimes accept it. So, deeper 100%, less deep, and another percentage, I don't know, let's say 20, and this percentage doesn't, always, doesn't have to be fixated. It can be done in a way that if it's a little bit less deep, you will have a higher probability than if it's much deeper. So, which probability you will use will be something we will see later on. In this way, you won't go down here in Cape Town and trying to see how deep the Nile is. You will stay inside the Nile. We will probably very often sample here, then sample a little bit here, go out again outside. But you will, in general, sample the Nile. Of course, you will have to test if you're in, if you're out, you could go again back, but you will always more or less stay in the Nile, as I said, without going in, I don't know, in Morocco or whatever. So in this way, without having to know where the Nile is, how deep the Nile is, the probability of the Nile, you will still be able to almost only sample the Nile, even though you, all you knew in the beginning was where Africa is. Let's see how we are going to apply it. And actually what we are going to use is the, in molecular simulations, actually the kind of important sampling we use in molecular simulation is called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And we'll see it better later on. I hope you enjoyed the video. All the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, 
links in the description. And if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time. I'm Maurice Karnbrook for The Computational Chemist.